All right, we'll just peer in. <laughs> well, welcome to our first speaking series, our first talk within the College of Liberal Arts Faculty Colloquium speaking series. Uh, my name is Erska Dobersik. I'm an assistant professor of psychology uh, department here at USI, and I am coordinator for the next couple of years um, after Dr. Shri Dandakar has passed the torch um, to be a coordinator for, for the and speaking series engage, engagement, speaking series, if you will. Um, and if um, you are a student, I know uh, Dr. Uh, Minda Roberts uh, offers, I'm assuming, extra, extra credit mm -hmm. in a couple of her courses. Uh, so please do see me after the presentation uh, to put your name on so you get the, the credit for, for being here. Um, so today we have a wonderful speaker um, who is opening the floor uh, to our uh, fall 2019 um, colloquium. Um, that's Dr. Um, Melissa Stacer. Uh, so I'll say a few words uh, about her uh, and then the floor will be yours. Um, but actually, before we um, talk about introduction, uh, let me announce the next uh, speaking series, which will be on October the 18th uh, by Dr. Joseph Yudehi. I apologize if I mispronounce your last name. Um, so it will be here um, in this room uh, on the 18th at 3 p.m. Okay. Uh, and if you are interested in presenting, uh, being involved in a speaking series, uh, please do let me know. Um, okay, so Dr. Melissa Stacer is an associate professor of criminal justice here at USI. Um, her research interests include institutional corrections, justice involved, involved veterans, and criminal justice education, as well as re-entry initiatives, including faith-based programs and ban the box policies. She received a number of internal and external awards for her teaching, mentoring, and research. Some of her work has been published in Victims and Offenders, the Journal of Crime and Justice, the Journal of Offender Rehabilitation, and the Journal of Criminal Justice Education. So let's please welcome Dr. Stacey. Thank you Thanks for coming today. I really appreciate it. I know it's a Friday and classes are over. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that you've come out. Uh, I want to just give a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. It's really about the progression of my teaching uh, and how that evolved into several different research projects. So I'm gonna start by talking about the process of taking students on field trips to jails and prisons and how that evolved into research, researching the impact that those tours actually had on students, working with student research assistants, um, how having that access to correctional facilities allowed me to do a survey with people who are incarcerated and then my most recent project where I interviewed people who were incarcerated who had also previously served in the US military. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, I don't have a lot of pictures. You can't take pictures when you go to prison or jail. <laughs> so uh, not a lot of pictures up there. A lot of stock photos, perhaps. So I started at USI in the fall of 2010. In the fall of 2011, I taught a class on prisons for the first time. And it was, it, that's an elective course in our criminal justice major. Um, and it was very natural to want to include a field trip to a prison in that course. I really felt it was important for students to see the inside of a prison when they're taking a class on prisons. So, I mean, I just sort of cold called some prisons and asked, what can I do to bring students here? What is the process? What, what do I need to do? So I needed to find out what the prison needed me to do. I also needed to find out what USI was gonna make me do in terms of having approval, and how am I gonna get students there? So there was, a, there was quite a lot of things here. Um, I learned about how to ask for money to get rental vehicles to take students to prison. Um, I learned about liability forms and waivers. Uh, what can students wear to the prison? What can we bring in? So it was a, it was a lot of stuff. Um, in the beginning, the paperwork was not terribly difficult, and the students generally wanted to go. They were excited about the opportunity. This is one of the correctional facilities that we go to in Perry County, this is Branchville Correctional Facility. It's a men's medium security facility. But I really thought students should go to more than one. So I wanted to have more than one place that we went to. So um, the tours were originally optional, 
And I really thought students should be able to make some comparisons. You can probably tell just by two stock photos that there is a big difference in the physical plants at different facilities. Um, so I decided to also take students to, uh, this is Kentucky State Penitentiary down by Eddyville. Um, it really does look like that. Um, and I, I actually had a, a, one of our alumni was out boating on this lake, and took a really nice photo and posted on our alumni page a few years back. But touring multiple facilities would give students more than one experience so they could compare and contrast. This is a men's maximum security facility. And then that same year, we also went to a women's facility so they could compare the different security levels, um, male versus female incarceration, the very different looks of the prisons. So originally it was optional, and I offered extra credit to the students to go in one class, but in this original class, I essentially allowed the students to write an essay reflecting on their experience to take the place of an essay that they would already be writing for the class. They had to write an essay every week based on the readings. Go to prison and you can write about that instead of the readings. So people were really attracted to that. Um, but I felt it was important that they not just get credit for going, that they reflect on the experience. What did they think it was gonna be like? What was expected or unexpected? How did it match what they thought? How did they feel when, when they were there? So it was very successful. Fall 2011, we went to a couple facilities and went pretty well. Then I started teaching, um, I teach a class, um, an introductory course in corrections, and I thought, okay, let's go to jail in that class. So I decided to start incorporating jail tours um, for this introductory corrections course. Quick note about jails versus prisons. Most people in jails are local institutions. Most of them are county level. So if you watch any local news, you know about the Vandenberg County Jail and you hear about overcrowding. I live in Posey County. Posey County built a new jail in the last couple of years. These are places where people go and they're arrested and many people there are not yet convicted. So they're pre-trial. Most of them are pre-trial. The prisons hold convicted people, convicted of felonies. So they're very different populations. I wanted to take the introductory students to jail because it's closer. <laughs> so, really, that's the only thing, that, that was it. I'd love to take them to jail, but usually I would teach two sections. I would have 60 students. I'm not renting vans and going to prison, you know, day trips for that many students. It's, it's very onerous. But if they go to jail, we can drive individually. It doesn't take as much time. They still get that experience of going behind bars. So, once again, started with the optional trip. We started at Vanderbilt County Jail which really does look like this. Um, I, didn't, I can't take any pictures, but this is really what it looks like. Um, so this was a lot easier to take those students to. Uh, when I have 60 students, I normally have several tours at different nights, a weekend tour, trying to accommodate, accommodate those different schedules. And once again, they have to write an essay if they want credit for going. They've got to reflect on it. That was such an important piece right from the beginning. So we started by going to the Vanderburg County Jail, but as I mentioned, I live in Posey County. And the same, same idea, thinking about going to different prisons, applies to going to different jails. Posey County's very rural, and they had, when I first started, this very different looking jail complex. I mean, they could hold like 60 inmates. You know, very different from Vanderburg County. Well, they have a new jail now. So going, hearing about that building process, um, seeing the different kinds of jails it was really a fascinating time to be going to that particular jail. So normally there'd be five jail tour options. Three at Vanderburg, two at Posey. Um, I would encourage students to go to both so they can make those comparisons. Okay, so when you're getting ready to take students to go to prison or jail, there are a lot of things you have to think about. And one of them is the dress code. There are very strict dress codes, particularly going to prison. I actually got some updated dress code information yesterday about a tour I'm taking my students on in about two weeks. And it's gotten more restrictive. Um, so particularly at prison, so a lot of what I'll, I'll say about dress code applies when you're taking students to prison. A lot of current fashion is not prison wear ready. Leggings are not pants in prison, <laughs> or ever, depending on your perspective, but definitely not in prison, <laughs> definitely not in prison. So telling students, you, know, you can't wear leggings to, to the prison tour. We're starting to run into problems with tight clothing. 
a lot of jeans and pants are snogged all the way down, and that's not okay. It's not okay in prison. Um, rips, tears, anything on your pants that's showing skin through is not allowed. Um, shoes, no sandals. You're taking those shoes off to get in, so you probably want to wear socks. If you're not grossed out, you know, if you, you don't have to wear socks, you don't want to be grossed out by being barefoot on some of these floors, but, you know, wearing shoes and, and making sure you have socks on. Jewelry. I've learned about people having piercings and piercings and placings that I want to talk about, <laughs> uh, but you're limited on your piercings. Um, some other things are the changes over time. So we go through a metal detector in many places, and it's very sensitive. So now I get to joke about my regular bras and my penitentiary bras. <laughs> <laughs> Underwire bras set the metal detector off. <laughs> Things you may not think about. And so I have to remind students, okay, where do you have metal in your clothing that you might not think about? Where are you pierced that I don't want to know about, but just take it out before we get there? Um, we have to talk about those kinds of things because we don't want to get there and have somebody not be approved to go in. Sleeve, like I would not get in like this. Sleeveless is not good. My pants are way too tight. They're too short. My, my flip flops are not okay. My earrings are okay. My wedding ring's okay. Fitbit, smartwatch, not okay. I don't have a phone on me, but most of you probably have a phone with you. No go, no phone. So we have to kind of go through all of the dress code and what you can bring and what you can't bring. And sometimes it gets more complicated. So I've recently learned, as of this morning, that the students are no longer allowed to wear light blue, orange, or khaki colored shirts. They're changing the uniform, so they're still in khaki, but they're gonna be switching to light blue. So they can't wear those colors, can't wear orange either. So that was a new one. Um, no hoodies, no hats. You get the idea. A second major thing is simply getting the students mentally ready to go. They're, they're usually pretty excited. Everybody wants to go to prison. Um, <laughs> but they don't usually have a good idea of what to expect. Um, I try to be very upfront that you're probably gonna feel uncomfortable when you go on this trip. Um, students are excited to go, but sometimes they're nervous to go or they're uncomfortable thinking about going. Um, when we go to the prisons, we're subject to pat downs. Many students have not been patted down before and that's an uncomfortable experience if you're not expecting that um, or you're not really sure how invasive that's gonna be. So I try to give them, you know, you want to know that this is going to happen to you when you go there. We also go to places that typically don't allow us to interact with inmates while we're there. And that lack of interaction is actually the problem because it's, it's putting that distance between the groups and it makes students really uncomfortable. They, they get the, I feel like I'm at a zoo and I'm watching zoo animals. And they'll write about that in their essays and how uncomfortable it is looking at people's private spaces. They're not really private, but that's where people live. And so that uncomfortable feeling. So over the years, I've noticed a lot of students get what I call the nervous giggles. They get uncomfortable when they're there and they start giggling as a response to that uncomfortableness. So now we talk about, don't get the nervous giggles. Like, you know, you're gonna feel uncomfortable and you gotta think about, you're, rep you're representing the university. You might be working here someday. Your classmates might be working here someday. And why are you here? You know, you're here to learn, to see what it's really like, to see what we're learning in class and in real life. That is a really, really important part, but I feel like if the students have some idea that they might feel uncomfortable, they can sort of be better prepared for, for that feeling when it comes. A final thing I wanna mention about getting them ready is what to do afterwards, after the tour. You gotta debrief afterward. We have to talk about it in class afterward. They need a space to reflect on what they've seen, Sometimes um, they see things that they were not expecting. Um, several tours have been flashed. They see people you know, who are really out of it on drugs sometimes at the jail. Um, they see clearly mentally ill people and they're uncomfortable about, about it and they need to talk about what they've seen. They need to talk about how what they thought they'd see didn't match what they did see and, and sort of reconciling those perspectives. An interesting thing that comes out of this is that zoo-like feeling. But I've noticed as time went on, students started writing about feeling like they were the zoo animals because so many inmates are watching them on the tour. So that was kind of a change that I noticed. First, they talked about 
feeling like they were watching inmates, like inmates were animals, and then they switch it around in later semesters, talking about they feel like they're the ones on display. That was kind of interesting. Probably the number one thing that they, they notice is they're always looking for their phones on the tours. <laughs> they don't have their phones. And that is really uncomfortable for people. On a two hour prison tour and you don't have your phone, people really do feel uncomfortable about that. And so sort of talking about even something like that is really profound for a lot of students. So by the fall of 2013, I decided I wasn't gonna make it optional anymore. <laughs> you gotta go to prison unless you have a legal reason you cannot go. Haven't had that happen yet. Um, we also discovered if we stand on the public road, they'll let us they'll let us take a picture. They'll take the picture for us if we're on the public road. So this is a bunch of us in 2015. Um, so I decided, you know, the students want to go on these tours. I think it's so important for them to go. Let's just make it a mandatory part of the class. About that time, during the summer of 13, um, a good friend and colleague of mine, uh, Monica Salinas Saunders, she's a, uh, a professor at um, IU Northwest. We, she also took her students on prison and jail tours, and we started talking about maybe we should study what they're learning. <laughs> maybe we should study the impact that the tours are having. Um, so we decided, let's make a study of this. And we've been research partners since 2008, so we know each other really well. Like, let's collaborate on this. So we decided we were gonna survey students before and after they went on the tours. And then almost <coughs> as an afterthought, we thought, well, they're all writing essays for class. Let's collect those too. But we were really focused on the survey. So we wrote the survey together. We did our IRB approval. And we did our IRB, we're good to go. Started collecting some data. Um, so Monica had some logistical issues on her end. She wasn't really able to collect a lot of data. Uh, but from 20, fall of 2013 to the spring of 15, uh, I was able to collect 114 pairs of pre and post tour survey data and 80 student reflection essays. Okay, this wasn't that long ago, but Qualtrics was not readily available on this campus. And I was kind of old school and I did paper surveys with the students, which meant somebody was going to need to input all this data. And it wasn't going to be me, because I didn't want to do it. And I thought, this is a great experience for a student. And I was very lucky that um, in the fall of 14, I had a student who told me that research methods was his favorite class. And I thought, bingo, bingo. So I was very fortunate to get Ryan Eagleson, uh, who's here today, he's here today, um, to be my research assistant. So he was actually with me in the spring of 15 during the last semester of data collection. So he was actually to go in and facilitate some of the surveys. I would normally explain the design of the survey and leave the room and the students just kind of manage themselves. He was able to go in and, my, and facilitate that survey process. So he was able to see that. Um, so he did an independent study and then he stayed working on this project. Um, here we are. Here we are. Um, we went to the uh, 2015 Indiana Academy of the Social Science Conference. It was here uh, in Evansville. It was at the University of Evansville that year. Um, and we were able to um, present the results of this quantitative analysis that he did um, using the pre and post survey, uh, post tour survey data. Um, so the paper was really a lot of fun. Uh, we looked at student attitudes about corrections, inmates, um, correctional officers. And, and one of the main things we found was that students found that they, they thought correctional officers were more caring after the tour than before. And it was a statistical difference, even with that small sample size. We were pretty excited. We submitted our paper to the Journal of Criminal Justice Education in December of 2015, and we waited. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted us to hear something, because he was graduating spring of 16, and I, was, I really wanted to have some good news, like, happy graduation, we got published. And we waited for 10 months. It was a very long time, but our paper was accepted as is. No revisions wow. at the Journal of Criminal Justice Education. So it finally came out in print um, 2017. So I was really excited about that. Um, Ryan's here. He's currently an Evansville police officer, and he's enrolled in the MBA program here at USI. So pretty exciting. But what about all those essays I had? Crap, I hadn't done anything with those. It was an afterthought to even include them in the IRB. I hadn't really thought about what I was going to do with them. Let's, let's see what's in those essays. So Ryan and I looked at the quantitative stuff, and I decided I need to have somebody to work with me on the qualitative essays. I want to have somebody to go through the essays together with me. 
So I applied for some money for a student research assistant. I put the call out to the students and I interviewed some criminal justice students and I found a student who was, I just had her in class and she was interested in the research and I thought she would be interested in wanting to be just more than a research assistant. Ryan was more than a research assistant. He became a co-author on the paper. So I found Lydia Mall. Lydia's here today too. She was a criminal justice and sociology double major too. Um, she was entering her junior year and I thought, I'll get her for two years if I hire her. <laughs> so that really played a role and I thought, if she's interested, you know, this is great. So we began working on qualitatively analyzing the, the essays. And at first, I had one specific theme that I wanted to look for. After grading the essays over several years, I realized how many students wrote about careers, what kind of jobs they wanted, whether they thought they could work in the jail or the prison or not. And I didn't ask them to put that in their essays. They just did. And so I thought, we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at careers. Does going on the tour impact how they think about their careers? So that's where we started. We ended up examining several other themes. I paid her for a year, and then she was my slave for a couple more years. She has stayed on the project. Lydia's in her second year uh, MSW here at USI. So she's a 18, 2018 alum. But we've been able to travel to a lot of different conferences. Um, actually, we were talking before this about she really wants to go on another one because we got used to traveling to these. So we were able to go to five different conferences over the last couple years. She got to travel more than you, Ryan. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. So in the spring of 2017, we went to two different conferences. We went to um, the American Society of Criminal. Oh, that's in the fall. Sorry. In the spring, we went to um, um, Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences in Kansas City. And we went out to Indianapolis to the North Central Sociological Association. Fall of 17, we went to Philadelphia, the American Society of Criminology. In the fall of 18, we went to Indian Academy of the Social Sciences, which was in New, uh, New Albany, day trip. It was, that was the day trip. Um, but then, we went to Hawaii. <laughs> in February, we went to Hawaii. Um, you can't see the view out those windows, but it was amazing. It was an amazing view. Um, Lydia had her funding, uh, her travel funded through USI, through the Endeavor grant. So if you're a student wanting to do research and travel, she had a lot of things through Endeavor, um, Student Government Association, and now that she's a grad student through graduate studies as well. Um, so we were able to go to a couple different, uh, many different conferences in different places. We got our first paper um, using those essays published in Journal of Criminal Justice Education. Um, that just came out this past year, uh, but it was accepted back in 2018. Um, we have a second paper that just got rejected this week, but we will persist. <laughs> We've been persisting for a while, um, and we have a so we, and we have a third paper. So we have three different papers that she's been uh, that she's a co-author on. Um, that first paper here really was about that career focus. Um, that while a few students going on the tours made them basically say, hell no, I'm never working in the jail, a lot of the students really didn't, they just never thought about it. So a lot of students really did talk about, I never thought about this, I think I could do this. Some talked about the stepping stone into, um, into law enforcement. So it was a really, it was a lot of fun. The, uh, this, the, the rejected paper um, is looking at the student expectations of what they thought prison and jail and inmates and correctional staff would be like. Uh, and how those expectations derive from the media they consume. Uh, and how the tour really showed them that it's not like what they see on TV. The third paper is almost ready to go. I think it's very close to being submitted. And that one um, in particular looks at the realizations that students had. Um, some of the prison as zoo uh, theme is in there, as well as the idea that students started to see inmates as normal people, as people like that. Um, that they could very easily have done something that would land them in jail, jail in particular. Um, so I did a lot of teaching research and I had a lot of help uh, and it was a lot of fun to do this. But my primary interest was always institutional corrections. So prisons and jails and the people who are confined in there. So I, one of the goals I set for myself in graduate school was I wanted to collect original data from incarcerated individuals. I had done all secondary data in grad school, so I really wanted to collect data from, from inmates themselves. So I decided I was gonna do this. 
Um, my first project, I wanted to do a survey with inmates. And this was a pretty daunting approval process for me because not only was it an IRB review here at USI, um, for protecting human subjects. I also had to go through the Department of Correction. So that's what DOC is. I had to go through the Department of Correction approval process. Inmates are a protected population when you're doing research because they are involuntarily confined. I don't want to be there. And it's that coercive environment, so there's issues with consent. So there's a really long process. You want to make sure that, that you're protecting their rights. Um, it took me a little bit to get through I had unrealistic expectations about the Department of Corrections and what they'd let me do. Um, it took a while. I'd say the whole process uh, it took about a, about a year because the IRB wanted site approval, but the DOC wanted IRB approval, and so I kind of had to figure that one out, which was easy, but we figured that out. I really wanted to do the survey because I was particularly interested about that first bullet point. What do you inmates think about prison tours for students? So I was very inspired by the research I was doing on the students because I realized that there were some ethical objections to taking students on these tours. They were objectifying inmates, they were in their space, uh, that it's entertainment. And so I started wondering, what do inmates think about this? Has anybody asked them? And I found that nobody had. There were two articles I found written by inmates who basically said, I feel that this is wrong. But nobody had done any sort of systematic research looking at inmate perspectives on this topic. So I thought, I'm definitely gonna ask about this. And I asked about some other things too. I was interested in perceptions of the social physical environment. Um, there was a really cool scale that I, I had found about readiness for treatment or rehabilitation readiness. If you're going to do a survey in prison, you want to get all the data you can in one go. So they didn't necessarily flow together, but I thought, okay, five pages isn't too long. I'm going to roll with it. I was unrealistic in how much data I thought I could get in terms of the number of inmates that could do my survey. I originally wanted a lot of inmates from each facility. I wanted to go to 13 <coughs> facilities. Department of Correction has a review process, but each prison warden gets to decide if a researcher gets it. I got three of them to let me in. <laughs> Two of them were places I take students on tours to. Those people knew me, and I think that really helped. The war, in, in particular, the warden at one facility, she's like, she, she knows who I am, I know who she is, and it was not, she sees my name come through and she knows I'm gonna do what I'm supposed to do and do it properly. You know, we have that kind of relationship. So I think that really helped. I did not interview, or excuse me, I did not survey hundreds of inmates at each facility. DOC told me two to four percent. So I ended up with a really small sample size. Uh, but, you know, it, it happened. When I went to each facility, I'm going one day and surveying all the inmates I'm allowed in that one day. But I still have to think about all the same things when you're taking students. I gotta think about what I'm wearing, what can, I, what can I get in the facility that I need to have to do the research? Luckily, paper surveys and pencils are pretty easy to get in, but I did have to collect and count the pencils. And not just because I need them for the next group, but because they can be kept for nefarious purposes. Um, so I had to think about what I would be allowed to bring in and what I wouldn't be allowed to bring in, what I can give the inmate to keep, like a copy of the consent form, that's okay, but no pencils. So the first topic I focused on was those inmate attitudes about prison tours. And I just felt like nobody had ever asked them before. And this was, it got accepted, but it's not coming out until to, to December 2020. But what I found is that a lot of, I think a lot of inmates hadn't thought about it before. Had a lot of neutrals on, on a Likert scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. A lot of neutrals. But there were a lot of items too that inmates really strongly felt about those statements. And they really did want to talk to students on tours. They felt like it was important for students to go on the tours. So although there was some, maybe they haven't thought about some issues, they really did in general support the idea of having tours and they desired that interaction and thought that students would be better served by interacting with the incarcerated and not just be shown around by, by correctional officers. So my sample size was only 154. I'm limited in what I can do, but I have high hopes for a couple other papers doing some exploratory analyses on those. But I'm always thinking of the next project. So I wanted to apply for sabbatical. 
and I thought, I need to have a cool project, I want to do something, I want to do interviews. One of my other interests, um, it, and it sounds like it's totally unrelated to all these other things, but I'm really interested in military veterans that are now incarcerated. So I know it sounds crazy, but think, think through this with me for a minute. The military environment is actually pretty similar to the prison environment in many ways. Uniforms, chain of command, you do what you're told, you have no privacy, you live with a lot of other people, um, close quarters. I thought, there's something here. And there's not a lot of work on this population. Um, a lot of the work on just, we call them justice involved veterans. It's military veterans who are now involved as offenders in the criminal justice system. So what I found is that there's not a lot of work out there beyond the veteran court movement, which is like drug court, but for veterans. So it's community corrections. So I, want, I really wanted to go in there and, and talk to people who, who were in this group. I wanted to know about their whole lives. I, I was interested in that life course perspective. What pathway were these individuals on that led them into and out of the military, but then into prison? Because those don't sound like they should go together. So I really wanted to find out more about them. So of course, I needed IRB approval. And I needed Department of Correction approval, but darn it, I knew what I was doing this time. And I got approval so fast, I was really excited. Um, I got the sabbatical, I got money to pay for my travel, and to even transcribe the interviews, because the prison said they'd let me bring my digital recorder in. I coordinated with the first of the two prisons I was going to, and I was ready to go. So the first prison I went to was about a two hour drive away, and I was told to arrive by 7.30 in the morning. So I knew it was going to be an early morning. And then I realized that the prison was in the Eastern time zone. Mm -hmm. We all make sacrifices for our research. And mine was getting up at 4 in the morning to drive to prison. <laughs> it was very different from doing survey research. I wasn't going to go in. And actually, I sat in a room very like this for the survey. I've got two COs with me. I'm handing out surveys to a bunch of people. They take it. They're gone in about 20 minutes. Interviewing was going to be a lot different. I was going to be one-on-one. -on -one. I was going to be asking them to tell me things they might not really want to talk about. Uh, I knew I might hear about heinous criminal activity. The first prison I was going to was a maximum security facility, and you don't go there for literate. So I knew I might hear some things that were uncomfortable. But my research wasn't necessarily on their offending behavior. I was really interested in those pathways, those things that happened in their lives that led them to becoming incarcerated. I really wanted to hear about their whole lives, including those military experiences. So this is not exactly what it looks like, but it kind of looks like this, because I couldn't take pictures, remember? It's, it's, it's me sitting in a room, right? So many people have a misguided idea about what interviewing inmates is like. A lot of people assumed that the inmate and I talked over telephones, and we've got a glass or plexiglass um, partition between us. And prisons are, that's just not that common. Prison visiting rooms typically don't have that. So then people really assume that there's a correctional officer in the room with me to protect me. But that's a no-go. I need to protect their confidentiality. And the prison was totally fine with that. The prison administration, no problem with me sitting one-on-one -on -one with an offender. Um, upon learning that we're gonna, that there's no CO, a lot of people then assume, well, the guy's handcuffed, right? He's handcuffed to the table at least, right? No, we're, we were in a prison classroom down the hall from the chaplain's office. And this is like the town where inmates live. And they have free freedom of movement way more than people think they do, even in a maximum security prison. He was in a classroom with me, like he would go to any sort of class that was held in that room. And he could come and go within limits to that room. So it's me and each offender one-on-one, -on -one, um, there was a, the doors closed, but there's a window, there's a little window in the wall. So people walking by can look in and they can't hear us, but they can see us. But nobody's watching in the window. There was an officer stationed down the hall. So I told my mom, well, if I scream, they'll hear me. But I wasn't really worried about it. The, the <coughs> facility would never let me in or talk to a particular person if they thought it was dangerous. So I wasn't worried about that. I wasn't worried for my own personal safety because I knew that there are precautions in place here. If somebody is not, if somebody's dangerous enough that they don't want me to talk to them, they're going to tell me I can't talk to them. And there were very few individuals I was prohibited from talking with. 
pretty small. So when I get to the facility, I end up going through the same process of getting in, but now I've got that digital recorder. And what if I need batteries for it? So I had to have prior approval to take those in. You can't take something in that transmits. I couldn't just take my phone in and record on my phone. No phones. So I use a digital recorder. Um, I had to have my belongings searched every time I went in. Um, same thing. It was not really too big of a deal. I was used to this process by now. I thought I'd be able to do maybe one or two interviews a day. I thought, because inmates are busy. We think they don't do anything all day except sit in their cells. Well, in many places, they're not even in cells, and they're busy. They have a very structured daily schedule. Um, and so I thought, they're only going to let me do one or two a day. Well, they were willing to let me do four or five a day. And I thought, I've got this drive time. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. It was absolutely exhausting to interview people all day. Regardless of who those people are, it's really exhausting. I went into each interview blind. So I know the name of the person, as of that morning, when I show up, I know the name of the person. I obviously know they're incarcerated, and I know they've been in the military, and that's it. That's all I know when I go in. With one meeting, I need to be able to build rapport, uh, get them comfortable, explain the process, and do the interview. Most of the men I talked with, and I only talked with men, uh, with incarcerated men, uh, most of them were really interested to, to talk to me. I think they were intrigued that somebody wanted to hear their story, um, that somebody was asking them questions about their lives beyond just, why did you do this, or why did you offend in this way, that I wanted to know about their childhood. And that's where we started. I wanted to know about their childhood. I wanted to know what it was like growing up. Why did they join the military? What branch did they pick and why? What happened to them during their military experience? Why did they stop being in the military? Uh, what happened to them after that? So it was very much step by step through their lives. So at the, after the first day, I started getting guys telling me that they, they were even more excited to do it because word got around the yard about the lady professor interviewing the vets. <laughs> I'm quoting here, the lady professor doing, you know, interviewing the vets. They really wanted to talk to me. This is great, this is so great. Um, everybody was willing to tell me about their offense, except one person. So we got to that part of the interview where I asked them, can you tell me a little bit about why you're here? And some people were very forthcoming about what they did, how they're trying to be better people now, how they're trying to make up for what they did. A few people were, would tell me the offense, but they don't want to talk about it. Or they maintained their innocence. I only had one person who didn't want to tell me what he did. And just flat out, was, that's OK, we don't have to talk about that. And we moved on to the next topic. So I only had one person who didn't want to tell me. So I mentioned how exhausting it is to be an engaged interviewer. Because you got to maintain eye contact. The chairs look like that in many, in many of the, you know, in many facilities, and they did look like that in one of the facilities I went to. So you're physically uncomfortable, but you've got to stay engaged in what they're telling you. You know, that's part of having a conversation with somebody. So it was very exhausting, um, but it's even more so when they're telling you about their offending. You know, it's it's hard to sit there, um, even when they feel bad about what they've done. It's still uncomfortable. Some people want to do a lot of detail. It's also uncomfortable when you get, and then, you know, it doesn't happen often, but I, you get people get pretty graphic, like they're proud of what they've done. And I, I was lucky, I really only had one guy who really went into a lot of detail, and he was proud. He wanted to tell me about all the things that he did. And I keep trying to move him on. I don't wanna know about all this, like that's not what the interview's about, but he, he wanted to tell me, very graphically. Um, so it was really uncomfortable. I, I had a lot of sex offenders at one facility, and it's just absolutely exhausting to leave the prison, and then I gotta drive two hours back. Um, it was really exhausting physically, and mentally, and emotionally to do that. But luckily, I really just had that one guy who didn't really, well, I had a couple guys that didn't show remorse. This guy really wanted to go into a lot of detail. Despite some of the awful things that some of these guys had done, most of them would have been indistinguishable from somebody you would see on the street, somebody at a table next to you in a restaurant. Um, inmates are people too. Inmates are human beings. And they would tell me these stories, and, and many of them would talk about the programs they've done in prison, the things they're trying to do to improve themselves, 
that they want to give back to their communities. And for a lot of these guys, especially at the maximum security facility, we've told them they can't contribute. We've told them that they've done something that's too bad, that we will never let them out, or there's no chance realistically that they'll get out. Uh, but it, talking with these guys one-on-one -on -one really revealed, revealed their humanity in a way that a prison tour cannot. It really emphasized to me how important it is for those students to have the interaction with inmates, but so few places will let us do that. So it was, it was tough. I met a lot of guys who were very articulate, they were passionate about change, they wanted to give back to their communities, and they were being defined by the one terrible thing that they did 20 or 30 years ago. And so it sort of made me question, like, would you want to be defined by the worst thing that you ever did in your life forever? And that's how people think of you always. So it really made me question, what are we, what are we doing here? It was a, a, wasted, a waste of human potential for some of these guys. It was, it was really sad. It's just really sad to do this. Um, it's important for me to note that I also went to a medium security facility. And in general, those guys were not there for the most serious offenses, drug offending, um, lots of meth offenders um, at the medium security um, place I went, burglary, assault and battery. So I had a whole bunch of individuals who didn't have that heinous level of crime. Uh, but it was still really interesting how they, they were working, in many cases, to improve themselves and had sort of run out of things to do. I've done every program in the prison and now that's it. There's nothing for me to do anymore. There's no other way I can show I'm reformed and I'm just kind of stuck. So as each interview concluded, I shook their hands. I always shook their hand at the beginning and the end. And I always thank them for their service. Because remember, they're all, they're all vets. They're all military vets. Some of them were highly decorated military vets. You just don't know, you just don't know. But all of these guys had, had served our country, sometimes in combat, highly decorated. And so I thought it was important to thank them for that service. And most of them thanked me back. They, they were grateful for the opportunity in many cases to have somebody just sit and listen to them talk about their lives. So I interviewed 43 men. Um, the first paper that I've been working on um, looks at how they use their military experiences to adapt to the prison environment. Because they did. That was really interesting to me. I would ask them, has being in the military impacted how you do time in prison? And very few guys said no. They talked about boot camp. They talked about getting along with people in tight quarters. They talked about taking orders and how they know how to take orders. So they were able to adapt better to being in prison because they knew how to operate in an institutional environment. It's out for review, wish me luck. Uh, but my next uh, analytical focus is that life course stuff. Um, I noticed a lot, just doing the interviews, just in that process, so many of these guys had lifetimes marked by disruption. and I call it a lifetime of trouble. Parent, you know, family disruption, they're using drugs and getting into trouble when they're teenagers. They're joining the military, but then they're like stealing stuff from the army, or they're insubordinate, or they're getting in trouble for drug use. And then they get out of the military and they just, it was almost like they just kept getting into trouble. So I'm interested in looking at that particular focus because I didn't really have very, very many guys that seem to be dealing with combat, for instance, by using drugs and now they're in prison didn't really find those individuals. So what's next for me? Beyond all of the tons of data I still have to analyze, I'm always thinking about the next project. Um, I know I want to do more research on inmates, but the correctional career stuff that Lydia and I did, combined with the justice involved veteran stuff, I'm really interested in talking with correctional staff, particularly correctional officers, who have military backgrounds about those connections. They were in the military and now they work in a prison. So totally different population, but still those same threads of the institutional environment. So my research has been supported by a lot of things that I wanted to acknowledge. Um, I've had a lot of financial support as well as gifts of time. Uh, so the Indian Academy of the Social Sciences gave me money uh, and a, a lot of awards through the University of Southern Indiana from liberal arts and the university as a whole. Uh, the gifts of time through liberal arts research awards, um, faculty development awards through College of Liberal Arts have funded good portion, lots of portions of this research. 
Um, I had a faculty research and creative works award for some of this, as well as a sabbatical last year. So thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, kind of a two-part sort of thing. Did, did you ever have students who go on these tours either had family members incarcerated there or they themselves had been incarcerated? Okay, so they couldn't go if they'd been incarcerated to the prisons. And that didn't really, I don't think that came up in the prisons. I did have students in the who went to jail that had been in the jail not terribly long before, and I had to get special permission for them to do that. In terms of family members, no family members, but I did have students go to one of the prisons and see people they had graduated from high school with, who were like waving at them. Uh, so, we, so that became another prep point. You know, you're gonna, you might see people you know, you might see people you're friends with, you might see people from high school, uh, and, and what are you gonna do when you see people that you know? So we had to talk about that. And, and the official answer was, you can't acknowledge that, which was another layer of discomfort. Like that was the rule, is that you can't acknowledge that you know them, you can't go up and talk to them. But we did have to talk about that. Yes. What were your findings in terms of your interviews uh, with the prisoners regarding the prison tours? What did they think? Well, I didn't interview about the, the tours themselves. That oh, was okay. the survey. Okay, uh, and what did, what did you find on the survey then? Yeah. Well, they mostly were, you know, if they, so they get statements and they're agreeing or disagreeing, they're showing their level of agreement or disagreement on the statements. Mm -hmm. And so some of them are negatively worded and some of them are positively worded. And what I found is when they, when they strongly agreed or strongly disagreed, thinking about the, the way the question's worded, they largely were pretty supportive. They didn't feel put on display. Uh, they largely didn't, they wanted to talk to inmates or to students. They felt like it was important for the students to go on the tours. They felt like they would give more information than the officers doing the tour would. Um, so they largely, you know, but there was variation. So that was one of the sort of contextual things in the paper is, yeah, more inmates said that this was okay than not, but we do have some inmates that they weren't okay with it. But by and large, it was, it was majority support for students doing these tours. And that was across a max and two mediums, all men, who took the survey. Yes? Um, I'm just curious, when you did the interviews, and I apologize if you already addressed this in some way, but um, was there any sort of theme amongst the inmates or anything particularly insightful that you just weren't expecting? Yes and no. I knew, I sort of was vaguely aware that there were American Legion posts in these prisons. I hadn't really thought about how that impacted them. I didn't think, to, like, I'm pretty sure I didn't ask them, like, are you in the American Legion in this prison? But I asked them about things they were involved in, and very quickly I realized, hey, a lot of these guys are in the Legion here. So there's posts, there's American Legion posts in prison. So that was kind of unexpected, that this was a way for them to connect with other people they felt were like them. Um, it was a way that they could contribute to, their, to the larger community, because they would do community service kinds of projects to benefit the community through the Legion. So the Legion was unexpected to me. So like I knew they were there, but I just hadn't really put all the pieces together until they started telling me about it. Yeah. I, I wanna know more about these Legion posts. I think that's fascinating. Yes. You have um, right now, like, when they do this, like, this stuff that they don't wanna be judged for, how do you make sure that they don't feel like they're being judged when you're interviewing them? Right, so I try to, I try to let them tell me their story on their own terms. So a lot of the questions that I asked them were really not very specific in many ways. Well, can you tell me a little bit about why you're here? And then they just took off. And I'm nodding, and I'm looking them in the eye, and I'm engaged with them. And I think that they just felt comfortable. They, only one person didn't want to talk about it at all. Uh, but they wanted to tell me, and it was even if they were making excuses for what they did, even if they were trying to justify what they did. I mean, I had a guy talking about the home wrecker that stole his wife and how he wanted to murder both of them, but then he didn't want the kids to grow up without their mom, so he just, he just killed the boyfriend. <laughs> and he's, you know, right, so they're tender, even when they're excusing or justifying, the sort of, I'm not, no, I'm not judging you, I just, I wanna know your story. And I think that resonated with them. And then I just kept the interview moving. Well, what's it been like for you to be in prison? When did you come to this facility? And just keeping it, you know, keeping it rolling. I'm not 
you molested children? Because remember, I don't know what they've done when I get in there. Um, I have no idea until they tell me. And so I really could keep a poker face. I know it doesn't look like I can do that. But I was able to be like, oh, like, okay, let's, let's keep, tell me what happened then. What happened next? Especially um, at, well, at both places, and they would talk about some of the other facilities they had been at. They would maybe compare some of the facilities. That was kind of interesting. Some of them at the medium had stepped down from a maximum, and they talked about the different culture at the medium. I don't know who wants to go first. Um, what drew you to this particular career path? Because I. I imagine that must be, my dad worked in a lot of uh, prisons and stuff like that, and he still struggles with some of the things that he heard and witnessed. Um, so how, what drew you to this? Because a lot of that must be very hard to stomach. But I'm not there every day. Sure. I work here. <laughs> There's a reason I work here and not there. Um, I, you know, it's interesting to, because we always have that question, like, why did you pick your major? Um, when I was in high school, I had the chance to take college classes, and Intro to Criminal Justice was on the first class, and I thought, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And I don't want to, you know, I'm totally a cliche. Like, I was super into the X-Files, and I wanted to be like Fox Mulder, and work for the FBI. I had no idea what I was doing, right? Um, and then when I went to college, I'm very risk averse. Like, I could never be a police officer. Right? Like, I don't even like roller coasters, you know? <laughs> I don't really like open stairwells. Like at the library, there's that one staircase, like the floating, I don't even like floating stairs. So I, I, when I was majoring in criminal justice, I just didn't really know, like I knew I didn't want to be a police officer, and then I thought I might want to go into law school, but then you have to like go to law school, and dress up as a lawyer and do lawyer stuff, and that just sounded like a lot of work. So I, so I just skirted that. Um, and then I found my way into sociology, because I'm like these guys, I double majored CJ and Stosh, and then I thought, I always wanted to be a teacher, but I don't really like children, so that wasn't going to work. <laughs> so it just sort of all came together. Um, you know, first generation college student. So I didn't know about being a professor. And one of the professors I was working with was like, you should go to grad school. I thought, oh, I could teach. I could do research. I could teach and they won't be children. I could do research and whatever I want. This is what I'm going to do. Um, why prisons? You know, it sounds awful, but like, I to, it, the impact of that, the institution on individual people, and it's such a closed institution. I just found it so fascinating. I also really like zoos. <laughs> Creepy, right? Like, I don't know what this says about me. I don't know what this says about me. But I just found it so interesting, this closed environment. I just wanted to know more. And then I, the more I got into it, the more I realized what a marginalized, obviously marginalized population, and then nobody wants to ask people there anything that we don't know a lot about way incarcerated people think about different topics. Um, and we sort of forget that they're there because we want to forget they're there. That's why we put them there. So we don't have to deal with them. So they're, they're away and so we're safer from them. They're people. So I wanted to know what they thought because they're people too. It's a crappy answer, right? Sorry guys, I don't, I don't have any crime in my background. I'm not a raging criminal myself. They did talk about that, and especially as sort of that motivation to join the military. Many of the guys had military parents or uncles or somebody in their family, but a lot of them really didn't. And this was a way for them to add structure to their life post high school. That that's why they joined the military. And then some of them talked about getting out of the. I mean, even if they were still kind of screwing around in the military and not doing what, really what they were supposed to, they still benefited from that structure. And then when they got out, they don't have that structure anymore. But then they would talk about, well, now that I'm back in prison, I can use what I learned in that structured environment in this structured environment. And they did talk about that. Yeah, it was, it was really fascinating. Derek. I was just wondering, um, did you have any like career criminals? Like, uh, I like most people in, they, they would eventually come back and like, reoffend. Did that like, have any different like, people who were like first time offenders or anything like that? So a lot of the guys at the maximum were first or second time offenders. They're just there a really long time. And so it didn't, they didn't really have time to have a criminal career because they never got out. They had already been there for a long time. At the medium, I did have a lot more guys that had sort of cycled in and out. 
Um, I had a guy who basically told me he had made a career out of burglarizing um, uh, CVSs. Like that's what he did. <laughs> he would just go and like burglarize the CVS, and he like, consistently did it. Um, so I had a few folks like that. I had a lot more younger guys um, at the medium security, and so some of them hadn't been involved too long in the criminal justice system. I thought, oh, that'd be so fascinating to know what happens when they get out. A lot of them were getting, you know, they didn't have a lot of time left. They're at the medium, they were doing eight years or less left on their sentence. So it'd be interesting to know to what extent do they keep being involved in crime after they get out. And I don't know. What about prior to the military service? Were there quite a few that were involved in the juvenile justice system? Not formally in most cases, but they're definitely committing delinquency. Uh, they, they sort of had troubled, troubled adolescents, you know, even if it's minor stuff. There's still, a lot of them had that sort of lifetime of trouble happening. Um, and the, the military was a way to sort of get away from that. So these guys, not, they weren't entirely successful. Katie. Um, it seems like when I was younger, I would hear a lot of stories about people who got into trouble, like the judge said, mm. if you go into the military, then you yep. And I understand they don't do that anymore, but I wonder if any of the people yes. you encountered had got into the military. Because I had guys that were in their 20s, and I had guys up in their late 60s. I mean, I had a Vietnam era draftee. He was the only one who was very adamant he did not want to go back to the military. I mean, he went AWOL because he didn't want to go to Vietnam. Um, but yes, to answer your question, um, yes. Yes. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry. Remind, say your question again while I'm thinking about uh, it. People who went uh, into the military as an alternative I think I had two. I would have to go back and look. I think I had two that specifically mentioned that. And they had been incarcerated for a while. And it was, here's this alternative, you got into some trouble, pick one, you know, pick one or, you know, pick, go to the military or go to jail. Um, not very often. It was definitely a voluntary choice for most people. Oh, we'll go here and then go back. I know you had your hand up for a while. What percentage of African Americans that were actually there that would actually speak with you? I can't tell you that. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I know how many were asked. And I know how many said no, but I do not know the racial background of those individuals. I can, and I don't know what it is because I haven't calculated it. I could tell you the percent of the people I interviewed who are African American, and there, there were a substantial number of African American men. Actually, the, the Vietnam era draftee was African American, and, and that was the thread among the African American men was a lot of them were older and talking about, um, especially in their early childhood, segregation at schools and racism at school as being so influential in their lives and racial tension in their communities. And they're growing up in the 50s and the 60s and so forth. So that did, that did come up in those, interview, um, in those interviews, but I couldn't tell you how many, and they don't know, they don't know who I am, they know my name, but they don't know what I look like or if they're gonna be willing to talk. I don't know until I meet them. Um, so they, they have no opportunity to you know, make a decision once they meet me if they wanna talk, you know, if they've already said no, they don't. But I don't know anything about them, which is unfortunate. Yes? Um, during your research and course, did either you or your students not any major differences between the correctional facilities for men and the correctional facilities for women? Yes. So I call it triple whammy prison day. We go to three facilities in one day. It's a very long day. It's coming up in a couple weeks. We go to three facilities in one day. We go to a men's maximum, a men's medium, and a women's minimum. So a few years ago, that men's medium was women's medium. And then they changed it over. They needed more space for men. There's also a women's facility that we go to, um, like another one. And so students who can go on vault, the women's facility that's a medium that we go to kind of looks like a college campus. Mm -hmm. And so students are, they note that, or they'll talk about the murals that are on the walls when we walk into the housing units or into the classroom space. Um, so there, people will note, the students will note differences in, in how the facility looks, the, that social atmosphere, how it feels. Lydia's nodding her head because she went. <laughs> she went on some of these. So yes, um, some of the students talked about in their essays that they've got to see um, either the women's pod at the jail and then the men's pods. A little different experience with jail, but they got to see different prison facilities, men versus women. It was often something they would comment on. 
And then you, they're usually surprised at how nice the women's facility was. Because the yeah, they have a beauty shop, and they're often like, they have a beauty shop? They can get, the, I forget, do you remember how often they could get their hair done? It was like every, every, so, like, every so many weeks they could get yeah. their hair done. Yeah. Yeah. It was a tour guide. Women's prison a little more outgoing than men's since it was more appealing. I don't know. I mean, we have really great people giving tours. They were typically somebody in administration, and um, you know they liked giving tours mostly, uh, but it didn't. It did feel more laid back at the women's facility. Just that feeling when you go in there, and then the other facility we went to that was women well, is, is minimum. There's no fence. <laughs> so I remember one year we drove, we drove up in our, in our rental minivans and there was a female inmate, like clearly a, an inmate uniform, driving a combine in the field next to the driveway up to the prison. And the students were like, she's just going to drive off. It's like, there's no fence here, guys. Like it's a minimum security facility. They, they do run a farm. And so it was like, people just didn't know that. So when you hear about prison escapes, find out what level of security they escaped from. They probably literally just walked away. <laughs> Seriously, I'm serious, but it's still escaping, but they're not like digging with a spoon through the wall. <laughs> yes. Were the average years of service relatively low? Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Were the average years of service of the military vets relatively low? No. But, and I had all branches Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force. I think I didn't have any Air Force. I think I had one, a couple Air Force, a lot of National Guard. Um, and everything from I barely made it through basic training to years and years and years. Some of those years were not active, so they're you know they're not full time, but huge variation now. Yes. Uh, did you see with the veterans you interviewed that any of them felt like their military service or what they may have learned in the military actually made them more successful in being criminals? discipline or training or anything nobody they really said that it made them more successful in terms of conforming to prison rules they weren't as like they, they could follow the rules but nobody talked about you know it's, it's been yeah. some like but returning to like gang life after the right. military made them more disciplined to gang members right and and, and, that and kind of thing. so i had one guy who talked about gang membership and he was very very elderly in a, you know, he was in a wheelchair. He kind of never answered any questions and just sort of rambled on and kept telling me things that I, I wasn't really sure if I believed him about how he was really big in the Mexican mafia. And, um, most didn't talk about being involved in like organized criminal activity like gangs. Uh, but I didn't have anybody that said, yeah, I, I learned to be really disciplined in the military and that made cooking meth really easy to do because I was very disciplined. <laughs> Nobody really did that. Um, when they made those comparisons, it was really, once I got out of that environment, I just sort of did my thing, and now that I'm back in an institution, I'm drawing on that other institution and that, that, other, that training back then. So that was the parallel that they made, you know, one institution to another, and not really one institution to their criminal behavior. Did yes. your interviews um, with the inmates make you want to do more interviews of different types, or was it sort of oh, like... Yeah. Yeah, but 4 a.m. was really tough, and it was summer. I started them during the summer, so it's like, oh, school's not even like really happening. Um, no, it was it was just so interesting, and yeah, I want I want to do more interviews. You just get that depth of knowledge. You just yeah, you know, I did the survey, and it's great. Yeah, that survey doesn't tell me anything when I think about how much those interviews tell me. Hearing it in their own words their own lived experience, the impact things had on them from their own perspective. It's just, it was just an awesome experience. Even if I had to come home and be like, yeah, I talked about my job molesters today. You know, they have a story too. It was just really, yeah, I, I would absolutely do more, more interviews with inmates, even on really awful topics. I have some ideas. So, for example, in the state of Indiana, we have a lot of correctional facilities. Not as many as Texas, but we have a lot. So if you're a man, you have a lot more options because there's more. 93% of prison inmates are men. So there's a lot of facilities for men. If 
you're a woman in the state of Indiana, you can go to the medium, the max, or there's a minimum slash intake facility. So if you're at the medium, there's one medium, and it sort of has to serve all of those women who fall under that security classification. And so they have to sort of be a little bit more adaptable with what the, in that facility because they have to meet the needs um, for, for a larger, uh, diverse group of women. For the men, you know, if you, that's, that's why I had a lot of child molesters because the child molesters tended to be sent to a specific facility. So, but we can't do that with women because there's one facility for medium and one for maximum and so forth. So they, they do, it's sort of a catch-all. There are some states that have one facility for all women, regardless of their offense. So you really have to be able to address a huge group of women, very diverse offending, very diverse needs. So that's why we see some major differences there. And it's so interesting to hear how the correctional officers and the staff talk about working with men versus women. Uh, some pretty sexist folks out there. We, the students really reflected on that, some of the statements that were made on the tours by staff, uh, that they would much rather work with men than work with women, which I think the students found surprising, but it was sort of the physical violence was maybe a little bit easier to deal with, where the women, you know, it, it's mean girls, where they get a little catty and spread gossip about one another, and it's sort of relational violence. So that they, and the staff was not as interested, if they had worked it with both populations, they tended to say working with men was easier than working with women. Interesting. I saw a hand over here. No. Guys, look what time it is. This is great. <laughs> Thanks for Oh, I got one more. We'll do one more. We'll do one more. Um, did you notice any significant trends or patterns in the childhoods of the inmate community? A lot of broken homes. Yeah, dad's not there. Um, different men are coming through the house, poverty. But what's funny is they'll tell me all these horrible things about their childhood, but they often maintain that they had a good childhood. So that was really interesting. They tell me, yeah, I had a great childhood. And then they tell me all these horrible things that happened to them during their childhood or the things that made it tough. Uh, but a lot of tough childhoods out there. Yeah. Does that mean they didn't know the difference between a good childhood and a good childhood? I don't know if they were sort of not trying to blame their families for why they ended up in prison. That's what I suspect. Nobody actually said that. I mean, a few people said, you know, I came from a great home, and then they tell me, oh, their home's not great. But I think it, in some ways, was they're distancing their own behavior from their family. That's my guess. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for